Welcome back. It's time for another episode of WVU Marketing Communications Today. Live from West Virginia University. It's a syndicated show that sits squarely at the intersection of data-driven decision-making and modern marketing practices. Our host today is Nathan Pirat. I hope I'm saying that correctly. If not, I'm sure he'll correct me. Uh, he's the group creative uh, director at Epsilon and an adjunct professor here at West Virginia University. Welcome to the show for the first time, Nathan. Thank you very much. Great to be here. And did I butcher your name or did I get it close here? Got, got it close. It's Parat. Parat. Okay. Parat. Parat. You say tomato. I say tomato here. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the show. This is your first time hosting it. And who did you bring along to talk with today? Today we have uh, Joseph Jaffe. I think I'm saying his name right. And let me let me offer a quick introduction for for Joseph here. Uh, Jaffe is a multiple. Uh, author, serial entrepreneur, and one of the most sought-after consultant speakers and thought leaders on marketing and innovation and change. He is the admiral at the HMS Beagle, a strategic consultancy that helps clients navigate the journey to survival. Because let's face it, we're all in the survival business nowadays, aren't we? HMSB is uh, Jaffe's third startup venture after Evolution and Cran. He's worked with clients like Pearson's Nestle, Purina, Steelcase, Keurig, Dr. Pepper, and many more. He's also the author of four books, Life After the 32nd Spot, Join the Conversation, Flip the Funnel, and Zero. His fifth, fifth book is Built to Suck, The Inevitable Demise of Corporation and How to Save It. Love that name. And that's going to be out in uh, March of 2019. Joseph has been on, uh, you know, his, he's got a great uh, straight shooting, honest perspective. He's been on many major media outlets like CBS, ABC News, Wall Street, NPR, USA Today, and many, many more. And we're very excited to have him on this show and my very first show today. <clears throat> okay, well, welcome. And did we say your name correctly, sir? You, you said my name correctly, and uh, and from where I come from, which is South Africa, we say tomato. So uh, <laughs> tomato. All right, so good. All right. <laughs> and you got to tell us HMS Beagle. Wasn't that Darwin's ship? Is that was that what the Beagle was? Absolutely, and in fact, uh, that's kind of the uh, our spirit animal is uh, Charles Darwin. He uh, he has a great quote. Uh, well, actually, first of all, historically, the the HMS Beagle sailed. 200 years ago on its second voyage to the Galapagos Islands, uh, Darwin was on board. He wrote and formulated many of his thinking and theories on evolution, and he actually said it is not the smartest of species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but rather the one that is the most adaptable to change. Um, and that really is the essence of what we do at the HMS Beagle and, uh, and this whole practice that we're building around survival planning. That's great. Uh, Joseph, can you... Um can you explain a little bit more about what is survival planning? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, we we basically, uh, you know, at the HMS Beagle, but really, and I'll take a step back, which is just to say a little caveat, which is, you know, many uh, people write books to shill a company. Uh, I create companies to shill a book, um, meaning that I really feel and believe strongly in a message and an idea, uh, and I try and bring that idea to market as best as I can. So. Everything now, for me, triangulates around this idea of uh, being in the survival business and survival planning. Um, I think it's predicated on a couple of unbelievable pieces of data. And, you know, in, in this book, in, in Built to Suck, I offer up both anecdotal and, and empirical uh, data that suggests that the era of the corporation is coming to a close. Uh, and I'll just give you a few of them very quickly. Um, of the original Fortune 500 companies, from the list that was created in 1955, uh, 447 of them are no longer in the Fortune 500. So only one in 10 of them are still there. Um, between 2016 and 2018, uh, 50%, just over 50% of Fortune 500 companies had declining revenue in comparison with the previous year. Um, and we've also seen from... We've seen the actual lifespan of the S&P or the Fortune 500 company shrink from 75 years from 1967 to 15 years in 2018. Mm -hmm. So certainly, I don't think it's a stretch to come up with a, with a stake in the ground that says we're in the survival business from a corporation standpoint. I will add that when you actually look at the opposite end of the continuum from Goliath to David, startups know this. 
startups get this, and small businesses feel it every day. They know that 90 to 95 percent of small businesses will never make it beyond year one. So they they kind of live every day being in the survival mode with their survival instincts kicking in. It's just really getting the larger corporations to realize um, that they're on this slow path or, or slow road to decay and demise. That's, that's fascinating. Um, uh, I think the, that, that stat on how many businesses have gone out of, you know, the big the big businesses that are slowly, have not slowly decayed, but have, have gone off the grid uh, in the last few years is, is, pretty, is pretty shocking. You, um, I think you offer up four pillars on which you build a survival plan. Can you give us some examples of what those pillars might be? Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll certainly walk you through those. Um, I did want to take a step back and actually talk about um, why uh, I believe what I believe. Uh, besides the data and, and, and the research, um, you know, ultimately, um, there, there is a quote, which is why I called the book what I did. Um, Jay Shiat once said, let's see how big we get before we suck. And, uh, and I just kind of took that to heart, which is that size used to be a growth accelerator, but it's now a growth inhibitor. That companies have become so big, so uh, dysfunctional, so bureaucratic, so risk averse, so uh, political, and quite frankly, they're slowing down when the world is speeding up. But I didn't just stop at size. I also um, mentioned three other factors, which is age, uh, being a public company, and culture, or the lack of a winning and startup type culture um, in companies. And so when you put those together, um, I call them the four horsemen of the corporate apocalypse, the corporate apocalypse, if you will. And, and really, um, it, you know, the writing's on the wall. When you just think about how every large company, being a global company, used to be competitive advantage, but now it's become a competitive disadvantage. So, you know, it's very easy to point a finger uh, at, at, at companies that are struggling um, to kind of look at a Sears or a Toys R Us and say, I told you so. Um, but absolutely, I wanted to offer up some kind of a solution. And so those four pillars that you alluded to um, are, in a way, spins on, on familiar concepts. But I've tried to bring a, an unfamiliar or a, an original piece of thinking to the table for each one. And those four are digital disruption, talent resurrection, customer obsession, and corporate citizenship. So different spins on this idea of of uh, digital innovation, um, of employee engagement, um, of customer service, and ultimately corporate social responsibility, or what many people call purpose marketing in today's times. Um, and I cite a bunch of examples from Dollar Shave to, to Mondelez to Nike to Starbucks to Apple. That's really interesting. One of the clients that I work with is a very large company, and they all these, some of these symptoms that you just described, or uh, we're seeing that in action as we try to build marketing plans for them. Um, really, really fascinating. Um, why do you, why do you come, why do some, uh, excuse me, I'm stumbling over my words here. Why, why do companies struggle so much over the concept of, of failure? It feels like if you're, if you're going to challenge them to think about how big they are and, um, age, you know, their, their culture, uh, it feels like you could start really threatening some of the, some of the leaderships of these companies. So, um, why do they struggle so much with that concept of failure? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a great, it's a great question. And, you know, w what I would say first and foremost is that when you, when you actually look at these companies and, um, and their track record. You, you said that you have a client right now that is in that space. Um, the problem is, is that they can't get out of their own way. They really struggle to um, be able to change. It's almost like sometimes they recognize they need to change. They're just unable to do so. So one of those concepts is failure. And, you know, Failure is only real failure when it is an end unto itself. When it is a means to an end, it's really just a process of learning and learning from your mistakes. There are good types of failure, and then there are bad types of failure. The good failure is the mistakes that, as I said, you learn from. You make before your competitors do. The cost of entry is so low 
and you're able to pivot like a startup in terms of learning what you did wrong and making sure that you don't repeat that in the future. I, I use an analogy, a baseball analogy, which is if you bat, you know, point three 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 uh, throughout your entire career, you're probably a shoe in to the Hall of Fame. So that means for you non-baseball uh, listeners, uh, and I'm sure everybody knows this, um, that that means that every three times that particular um, person went up to the plate, they struck out or, or they were run out or they were caught out two out of every three times. So can you imagine that? You get to go to the Baseball Hall of Fame by failing two out of three times. But companies don't get that. They really punish failure. And, you know, as I write in the book, I'm not saying we should reward failure, but we certainly shouldn't punish it. That's really interesting. Um, you know, I was I was researching your blog, um, Jaffe Juice, and um, some of your ideas, and you you bring up this, this this thought of embracing your heresy before you know. Can you can you give us some examples of heresy marketing? I'm saying that right. Uh, I've got to be honest. I all I could have written the entire book on this idea of embracing your heresy. It was a concept that I originally heard an environmentalist by the name of Andrew Winston refer to. And then I just started riffing on this. And the whole idea is, can you face your deepest, darkest fear um, and turn that into a strength? So the first example is, what if you fired yourself and then rehired yourself the next day? That was actually done. Um, the late Andy Grove, who was uh, in charge of Intel at the time, fired himself, and then he was rehired the next day. And the first thing he did was get out of the business that they were, in fact, in. He began to diversify. But he, he needed that symbolic act to be able to you know, not signal to the entire company that bad habits and routines um, and being locked into status quo and incumbent type thinking had to change. Um, but there are a whole bunch of other examples that I cite. And, you know, one of them is, is what if you left money on the table or what if you slaughtered your cash cow? And I'll give you two examples. Um, the first is Netflix. The day after they shipped their billionth DVD, they shut down the DVD service and they moved, you know, full steam ahead into, into streaming um, and digital. Um, REI, you know, the outdoor travel and, and clothing and accessory company, they closed their uh, stores on Black Friday. And their mm. whole message was, get outside. Why would you want to come and shop indoors on a day when your entire family is together? Um, it yeah. was so on brand and on strategy for them. And in doing so, they, they were clearly able to break through the clutter. So those are just three examples. There are a ton more. It's such a fascinating topic. What if you funded your competitor? Um, what if you did a hard reset? What if you got out of the business that you were actually in? Uh, Amazon is a perfect example. They started out as a bookstore. They now are anything but or everything, including uh, a bookstore. Um, and then the final example is what if you gave away your product for free and still no one wanted it. Well, unfortunately, they call that the newspaper business. Um, so we see all of these heresies. They sound outlandish. They sound extreme. They sound futuristic. But every single one of them has already happened and come to pass. Hmm. Really interesting. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll get some more questions for you after, the, after this short, short break. Okay? <laughs> And it is just that, a short break to tell you about West Virginia University's online data marketing communications program. It's the first graduate program of its kind in the country, uh, and it focuses on strategic thinking, critical problem solving, and informed decision making. The data marketing communications program prepares you for your career by learning these innovative tactics from award-winning faculty like our host today here. If you want to learn more, just visit dmc.wvu.edu. A lot of letters just add up to the data marketing communications at West Virginia University. dmc.wvu.edu. 
D-U. All right, with all those letters out of the way, let's get back to the men who I'm sure have lots of letters after their names as well here, uh, Nathan and his guests. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, all right, Joseph. So you're, um, you know, you're uh, on demand for your knowledge and expertise. Are, are, and you're, I'm sure you're answering all kinds of questions on a regular basis from all kinds of people. Are there? What are the most commonly asked questions that you get as you engage in in our uh, marketing industry? Well, you know what? I have to tell you that I. I've given so many presentations around the world, and uh, I started hearing the same questions again and again and again. And so I decided to kind of nip it in the bud and answer all three of them in the book um, to prevent people from asking the questions to me and prevent me from biting their head off in the process. (laughs) So the first one was, what's the next big thing? Uh, And my answer is always a standard. There is no next big thing, you moron. The next big thing is now. Um, focusing us on, on you know, or, or focusing the people that ask the question on digital, on, on a website, on search, on email. Um, we still haven't gotten that right. And we're worried about a, an AI, you know, IoT enabled drone that delivers our Starbucks latte to us. It's not that that idea is insane, which it is. It's just that we have the basic fundamentals that that we've almost discarded or bypassed because we're worried about the next bright and shiny object. So that's the first question. The second question uh, has to do with who's doing this well. Everybody wants to know who's doing this well, like you write about in the book. And I came up with a kind of a snarky answer which is no one is doing a great job when it comes to survival planning, as evidenced by the Fortune 500 performance. Um, And the ones that you think are doing well uh, just have great PR departments. Hmm. A little bit of a snarky answer, but, but it's almost like, I think it's alluding to the fact that if you really are finding a way to break through the clutter and differentiate and create competitive advantage, why on earth would you want to live tweet about it. The third question is, how do we sell this through to senior management? And my answer there, it's less snarky this time, but it actually says the top-down cell is just one of four cells in order to get lasting buy-in across the board. There has to be bottom-up, which is engaging millennials, Gen Zers, new recruits, entry-level um, youngins, right? There has to be outside in, which is the ability to engage with thought leaders, influencers, decision makers, you know, faculties, universities, but ultimately being able to build these bonds with independent, objective subject matter experts. And then the fourth one, which I think is the most important and the biggest challenge, is inside out. And, and that's what I call the rot of middle management. Mm. So, you know, the C-suite gets it. The C-suite are smart. Um, they understand the need to change. But the ability to sell that into your mid-level manager who has the most to lose and the least to gain, that has to unlearn everything and learn new skills that isn't any closer to that golden parachute or that exit from the company, that's where the resistance um, takes place. And that's where so many great ideas fail and don't see the light of day. So change has to happen and sell-through has to happen in these four different uh, capacities and four different directions. Yeah, that's fascinating. Again, I see I see a lot of that with some of those companies that we're, we're working with. It's not upper management. It's the middle managers that we have to try and convince that this change is the right idea. Yeah, that's really, really um, on target. Um, so you are in the process of – or you're about to teach a class for um, – West Virginia, correct, is an upcoming course called Disruptive Innovation. That's right. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled, uh, ecstatic, quite frankly, to uh, be a part of this program and to be working um, with the school. Um, I've had two uh, goals or bucket list items in my life. One was to write a book, and I've written five, and the other was to teach 
um, and be associated with a with a school, um, whether it's a high school or college. Um, so I'm I'm super super passionate about it. Um, the idea in this course is to help students think about change and disruption and innovation from an exponential as opposed to an incremental level. And one of the things I've done is I've actually developed a survival planning canvas, um, which, uh, which builds on top of the same foundation as we've seen come out of the lean startup movement and the business planning canvas. And my students will be presented with this canvas on day one, and they'll have to pick a company that, that, that is on death watch, as I call it. Um, so preferably not a company that has failed already, but one that is failing or, or really struggling at the moment. Um, and that even includes the likes of a Harley Davidson, for example, that has always been um, lectured on at MBA programs and the like as a bellwether, a branding bellwether. And then every week they'll go through the canvas and fill out that canvas and eventually the goal will be using some of these techniques that they'll find in, in, in the book, in Built to Suck, using some of the practices that we employ at the HMS Beagle, but also leveraging some of the frameworks from my previous books. Zero, which is Zero Paid Media is the new marketing model, and Flip the Funnel, how to use existing customers to gain new ones. The goal will be for them to fill out the canvas, and then present a survival plan and a growth plan. Um, and who knows, we might even be able to take these ideas to the companies and see if the companies will uh, adopt some of these ideas and maybe even hire the students um, to help implement them. Uh, I wonder if they'll let faculty audit that class. I'd love to take that class. Um, it sounds fascinating. And we, awesome. I just had a student uh, have uh, choose Holly Davidson as their um, creative, they had to make creative um, campaign and they picked Harley Davidson. It was a loaded, definitely a loaded um, topic for her. Um, so yeah, I think the students will really benefit from what you're having, what you're going to be offering in that uh, disruptive innovation course. So I think we're getting down to the final minute. Is there, is there anything that you'd like to uh, send us off with, Joseph? We really appreciate your time. Yeah, I would, I, I, a few, a, a few final words, I guess. When you think about survival planning, for me, the idea is is we need long-term thinking as opposed to long-term planning. We don't have the luxury anymore of five-year plans um, and, and being able to even think one year ahead. Uh, literally tomorrow, um, something could happen that could destabilize the entire business. And so part of this idea of being in survival mode is to tap into what I call the survival instinct. And the survival instinct itself is activated based on two contributing sectors. One of them is self-preservation, and the other one is adaptation. Clearly, adaptation is all about change and, and evolution, and this whole idea of uh, the, you know, the su survival of the fittest, if you will, whereas self-preservation is about doubling down on the status quo. Um, and so I think, you know, students doing this course, but more importantly, anyone who even reads the book, what I hope they'll take away is, is how to be bold and brave um, and take exponential steps, but do that still in a strategic way and a strategic manner to effect what I hope would be uh, tremendous, sustainable, authentic, natural and organic growth. Wow, it, that sounds great. I um, you know, appreciate um, sharing that. Looking forward to, the, again, the students having access to that, and I'll be picking up the book myself there in March on um, 2019. So I, I think I'm getting the sign that we're, we're, we finished up this uh, my first ever podcast here. Really appreciate your, your time, Joseph, and your your uh, patience. And, um, and how does everybody get in touch with both of you? Give us some oh, contacts for both of you. <laughs> Start, here. Starting with the guest here. <laughs> Um, well, you could probably find me on Jaffe Juice. I'm Jaffe Juice on most social media channels, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, otherwise, just Google me, and you should be able to find me. And, uh, and Jaffe is spelled J-A-F-F-E? Jaffe is spelled how? J-A-F-F-E? Yeah, two, two F's, one E. Two F's, one E. All right. And Nathan? 
Yeah, best way probably is just through LinkedIn, my full name, and look me up, send me a message. That's that's how I talk to a lot of students and, and colleagues. So, Okay. Yeah. So how did it feel your first time out here? You, you, you're you ready to come back and do it again? No, I'm, I'm hoping I, you know, I, I, okay, pretty good. It, it helps that we have such a great speaker. <laughs> well, he certainly <laughs> gave a lot of disruptive <laughs> ideas here today. I, I still can't believe the number of corporations that have fallen out of the top uh, ranks uh, so quickly here uh, are some of the other facts that he uh, tantalizingly tossed out there. So appreciate both of you coming by here today. It's an honor. Thank you so much. All right. Well, you've been listening to another episode of WVU Marketing Communications today. Right here in the Funnel Radio Channel for at work listeners like you.